Nice. Horse. Okay, so the second half of the semester starts with uh, history of t uh, videotape formats or video formats, period. The history of video formats. So that's what we're going to talk about. History of video formats. Okay, TV happens in this country in the 1950s. In other words, the first broadcast. I mean, you could look it up and find out exactly what date it is and what the first show is, but you know, the relevance is, you know, really not that important at this point. Uh, in the 1950s, television is happening in this country. But videotape or, 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 or recording to videotape doesn't happen later on until the 1960s. So what's going on on television in this country from the 1950s to the 1960s? Okay? It's all, you know, it's live. You know, uh, live programming. or playback of films. That's it. Live programming, meaning the situation comedies, the variety shows, the comedy shows, that's all live in front of a live audience with, with a camera there that's feeding to a transmitter and someone at home in their living room is actually watching this happen live. Much like you see Saturday Night Live today, it happens live, right? That's, that's the only live programming we have on TV today, Saturday Night Live, or sports, like ball games are usually live. Uh, the news, portions of the news are live. You know, when the anchor, anchor is reading from the, from the teleprompter, that's live. Uh, any news breaking events, but basically that's it. Everything else on television is planned. It's, it's, it's really, it's pre-recorded and played back. It's the talk shows, all that stuff is recorded earlier in the day or on other days and played back on another day, okay? But, so, but in the 1950s, uh, bro broad, you know, broadcasting was basically live programming or playing back films that were made from the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s, old films. But you still see today on television, they're really very good. On Turner Classic Movies, you see old films from the 40s and 50s, even 30s. But they were played, in other words, they, they played those films, had the camera in front of the, of the screen, and the video camera was transmitting live what it was seeing you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the film screen. Kind of archaic, but that's you know, the way it was happening. So now in the 1960s, early 1960s, you have the first uh, video format. And it was a two inch open reel format. What that means is that it's, a, it's a spool of tape, okay, and the width of the tape is two inches wide. Okay, a spool of tape. Okay, the width of it is uh, two inches wide. And uh, this is a this is a major, uh, you know, a major evolution. This was this was major because what you can do with film that you can't do with um, what you can do with video that you cannot do with film is that you can record video, rewind it, and play it back. Film, I don't know if you know about this, but film you have to send the film off to be processed, in other words, developed. And if it's overexposed, the film's going to be too dark, and if it's underexposed, the film's going to be too bright, too light, you're not going to be able to see inside. Uh, then after that, you have to make copies of the film, because when you want to edit film, you have to physically edit it with a razor blade. If you physically cut the frames, here are the film frames, for example, you know, and let's say you, you physically cut them with a razor blade and then take the two, the two ends and tape them together. Dan, you have a question? Uh, no. No, you're stretching. You're allowed. <laughs> so, so film. So, if you have your original film and then you want to edit your original film, you can't cut into it with a razor blade because then it's ruined, for you know, forever. So you have to make a copy of that, and a copy of that, and a copy, etc. So then you could cut into the copies and paste them together. So you still have your original print. With video, on the other hand, you record. Press play, press record, you record, press stop, rewind, press play again, and then you play back exactly what you just recorded. That's the major, the major development, if you will, with video from film, the evolution from film to video. It's a that you immediate playback because it saves a lot of money because you can record something and you're not sure if you've recorded what you recorded, but if you stop for a second, rewind, play, see if you recorded what you actually thought you recorded, then you can move on to the next shot or the next project. 
Think about all the money that saves in terms of, you know, how long it takes to shoot a scene. You know, you have to keep people there. You know, for how long? You know, before you got the, you accomplish the, the the tasks of the day, which you plan on shooting for the day. So, you know, not only that, not only the production crew or the actors, but what about you know, renting the space and and facilities, the, the food. And, 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 and maintenance, you know, all that stuff, and, and sleeping, you know, accommodations, and, and travel, it's just, it's just the, the cost goes up exponentially. But with the implementation or the invention of videotape, you're able to play back immediately and therefore make a decision you can go on to the next scene or reshoot the scene. Now, there's some major disadvantages of the first two-inch videotape format. Major disadvantages. Okay, in other words, you could not edit. <laughs> so, what good is it? Again, the, it, it's good because you could record and play back immediately. So, programs that were really that were usually recorded with two-inch video were things that you could report, you could, you could play back immediately. What could you play back immediately? You know, performances, musical performances, speeches, game shows, things like that that you could, that happen that you just record, stop, rewind, and play back. So two-inch format was used a lot for that. Pre speeches, political speeches, things like that. So you could not edit. In other words, no freeze frame. No freeze frame. No shuttle motion. Free, you know, pause. Freeze frame is pause. In other words, you can pause on a frame and watch a specific frame. What's up? So you just couldn't edit whatever video you recorded? Is that what you're no, or you, what could, could you, yeah. you couldn't edit this. Okay, thank you, you couldn't edit that. People try to, and I'll go into that in a minute. In a minute, but that's the dis main disadvantage of two-inch video. But it was the first video format developed. It was the mm -hmm. first thing. It was like, wow, this is cool. We could do something else. But the problem is, you can't. It's very difficult to edit this because you couldn't freeze frame. You couldn't stop it. You know, pause it. You couldn't watch it in shuttle motion. Today, you watch video in fast forward or watch video in reverse, so you could. You could accommodate, you could watch like an hour of video in like maybe five minutes just by watching it and fast forward. And we do that with a DVD or with a movie or something you want to see, just fast forward and watch it. You didn't miss anything, but at the same time, you, you know, you watch it a lot faster. What's up, Dan? Well, now they have DVRs where you can like re rewind and fast forward, like, and like, usually I'll hit the rewind button, like, if I, if I miss something it's right. important. Right, right, exactly right. So, again, the problem. The problem with this two-inch format was that you couldn't edit. So people tried to edit. They tried to edit with a razor blade. But the, again, but you hold up videotape, and you can't see through videotape like if you hold up film. You hold up a film strip, you could see the images you know, through the film strip. I don't know if you've ever done that. Ever, had you, ever see old negatives? You hold it up to the light, and you could see the impressions of the image on the, on the actual strip. On the, so that's, you could do that with film. You hold up a piece of videotape, and it's just brown. You can't see through it. Because videotape is made of iron oxide particles, which is just a fancy name for rust. Rust. Sprinkled on acetate, sticks to the tape. And the, that rust is magnetic, okay? And, that, and uh, when it, you record in a camera or you record with a video recording machine, the video recording machine is putting out the magnetic pulses, and those magnetic pulses are arranging those particles to represent the color, light, and sound. So, but you hold it up, you have no way of knowing. So you can't cut it with a razor blade because you have no way of knowing where you're cutting. Early on, people tried to do this. What they did is they watched the video on the monitor, they stopped the machine, they marked it on the playhead, they played again, they stopped the machine again, marked it on the playhead. Then they cut out the tape and they, and they, they cut out the section in the middle and tried to tape the two edges together. But when you played it back, the video would play really smooth, all of a sudden jump out the edit. It was, you know, it was really very, very difficult. And some, some of the older films, Sorry, some of the older videos, older TV shows, you see they attempted to edit the video. And you can see how it's very jumpy. Uh, in TV2, I show the class some Twilight Zone episodes, old Twilight Zone episodes. There's six episodes they recorded on videotape. And uh, everything else was on film. They experimented with video, and then they went back to film because they had much more flexibility at that time in the late 1950s, early 1960s. But if you see the very... The, now they're cleaned up. Now they're re-edited and they're cleaned up, so it's kind of hard to show students at that point. But I remember watching them uh, on the Sci-Fi Channel and catch, capturing like, a, like one of the six episodes that were recorded on video. And I could tell it was on video. You know, th there was no depth to the shot. Uh, there was dropout on the frame. You could see like little white 
flashes on the frame, across the frame. Uh, you could see when they would cut from one scene to another, the whole, the whole image would jump up and down, like for a, for a split second. You know, you know. And uh, you know, it was interesting to see that, because you could say, oh, you know what that was? That was the right time. They were using two-inch video before you, they were able to edit with it, so they were trying to cut it with a razor blade. A couple of years later, by the late 1960s, early 70s, you have the one inch open reel format. The one, same thing, only the width of the tape now is not two inches wide, it's one inch wide. But it was, a, it was designed with, with the idea of being able to edit. So you can edit. In other words, you can pause, you can shuttle motion. So you can, you can edit. You can have separation of tracks. Separation of tracks meaning that you could edit the audio without touching the video or edit the video, the imagery, and not touch the audio. This, you know, engineers looked at this and said, you know, this is good, this two inch video is great, but uh, because it's a new format, the 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter film, it's a new format, but we still can't edit with this stuff. So a couple of years later, they developed a new machine which could take a smaller tape, and it was a much, uh, much more functioning machine, which the ability to edit was, was created alongside of that. This changes television. This is where it happens, early 1970s. Television becomes television ha as we know it today. A lot of programs are produced because they're shooting on one inch video, they're editing on one inch video, and they're airing on one inch video. So the situation common as you see out of the 1970s or the TV programs you see in the 1970s are usually video. And they, there's so many of them are produced because it's easier and faster to produce these things. You look at all the Norman Lear productions, the guy who produced All in the Family, and all the spin-offs of All in the Family, Jefferson's and Maud, and there were other shows, Good Times, uh, Sanford and Son, all these other shows you might see now on, uh, on TV Land, maybe, or, or you know, one of those, show, those channels that pet plays programming from the 1970s. It's all video. It's, it's, it's all, uh, there's so many of those programs. And this is because of this development. Now, it's, like I said, it's a one-inch open reel, but the machine is still very large. The machine, a one-inch tape machine, is very large. It's probably about, uh, you know, you figure maybe that big, like, you know, for five or six feet across by, you know, six or seven feet high. The thing's huge. The two-inch machines were half the size of this room because a lot of pick -up vacuum tubes in the machines. And, you know, we didn't have the, the, the computer chip yet. The computer chip doesn't happen until the 1980s, which changes everything again makes everything smaller and easy, easy accessible, easily accessible. So size, size is still an issue. This is way too big uh, to go out on location, but it's great for the studio. So in the 1970s, if you look at those shows, the videotape shows, you start to realize they never go on location in these shows. They're always shot in the studio. And the studio is made to look like a park, it's made to look like a location. It's not a location. Until in the late 70s, they came up with something called three-quarter inch cassette. Three-quarter inch cassette format. Three-quarter inch cassette format in the late 1970s, okay? This is, uh, you know, how big is it? It's about the size of my book here. Maybe a little bit. A three-quarter inch cassette is about this big. The width of it is three-quarters of an inch wide. But the tape itself is now this big. And, and you have your take-up reel, your supply reel, and your take-up reel in the cassette. It's housed. And you put this in the machine, and the machine goes in, goes in, and then it pulls the tape out and records on the tape. Or, and this is a big deal because this machine that, that works this tape is maybe about maybe a foot and a half by two feet. So now uh, an operator could carry it on their shoulders, and then they run a wire from there to the camera person who's running the camera. And then you have a two-person crew, or a third person if they're doing news with a microphone. But now you have a two-person crew. But now that 
changes again because you're able to go out on location and report things for real. Add the element of realism on location. So if we're going to shoot a scene, if we're going to have a conversation in the park, instead of doing dressing up the studio to look like the park, why don't we just go to the park? <laughs> and you know, there are other things you have to deal with in the park. You have to deal with securing the permit to shoot on location. You have to deal with rain, rain issues, you know, weather issues. Uh, you can't control the sound if an airplane flies overhead. You can't control that. Uh, you can't control uh, you know, weather. You can't control a uh, fire truck coming down the block. There's so many things you can't control when you're on location. However, it adds the element of realism, believability. It, it, you're more involved in, in the story because they're in the park instead of being in the studio to look like a park. Go ahead, Dan. You wanted to say something? So uh, let's just say you're a major news company out of the city and you wanted to film in like Central Park, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Prospect Park. You actually have to get a permit to film? No, not if you're a news agency, no. But if you're like an independent uh, company? Yeah. Only news, you, news cameras can go wherever they want to go. They had, that's the First Amendment you know, rights to do that, to deliver news to the people. They're protected by that. Uh, but you know, you can't set up a camera on a tripod on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, a cop will come and say, where's your permit? And if you don't have a permit, you gotta go. And getting a permit isn't hard. You just go down to the mayor, mayor's office, fill out the paperwork, tell them who you are, you gotta have a certain amount of insurance and things like that, and then you get a permit to shoot on Fifth Avenue. If you, if, if you want to do that, you know, so. But getting back to the late 1970s and the cassette format, which makes it very portable, much more portable than it was, what's going on in the news, news is still using 16 millimeter film. It's still using 16 millimeter film. Now why 16 millimeter film? Because the camera is only this big. Okay, so you could, if you have to do a news story on the on the sixth floor of a, uh, of a of an apartment building, you could walk up, you could do that. You can't do that with a one-inch tape machine because you can't get to get the one-inch tape machine in the truck or in the elevator or into, it's like a, it's crazy, it's insane. But with this three-quarter-inch format, the news people are looking and saying, "Hey," and saying, "We could start doing more projects out in the field, doing interviews with people. If there's a fire, we could go interview the people that were affected by the fire." If there's a, a traffic jam, we could interview the people that were affected by the traffic jam. In much more portable. That's called ENG, electronic news gathering. E N G, electronic news gathering. That's news jobs. You know, we, we, you know, you might see an ad in the paper. Uh, ENG cameraman needed for immediate startup. It means a news camera person needed, you know, for a job. ENG, elect, ENG, electronic news gathering. And, and uh, so now, in the 1970s, the news people are starting to see this three-quarter inch smaller format, and they're starting to make the transition. The fictional people, the situation comedies, are using it too. That's called EFP, electronic field production. Electronic field production. That's fiction. That's news. OK? Easier? EFP is electronic field production. This simply means a different style of shooting. You're shooting make-believe. You're shooting fiction, a fictional narrative in an EFP style shoot. In an ENG style shoot, it's a news. It's documentative in form. You're shooting news. Okay? So it's actualities and things like that. But they were both born out of this three-quarter inch video format. Really, because it, well, they weren't born out of ENG was 16 millimeter before it was before it was three-quarter inch, but you know, they, they both took off. ENG took off became more popular, easier to do because of the smaller format. And then the EFP people, or, or the fictional narrative people that were shooting in studios, were saying, hey, we could use this format to shoot on location and make it more realistic and edit, take this back, bump it up to one inch, to one inch video, and then edit it within our one inch video. In other words, bump it up means transfer the, the footage on a three quarter inch cassette to a one inch video tape. And now we could use it in the editors to edit into the rest of the rest of the program. It's it's I don't know if it sounds kind of crazy to you. It's like a lot of work to do some, very something very little, but that's the way it was done. Now we go to the 1980s, and here's another revolution. Things change in the 1980s. You have the Betacam, and the Betacam 
is simply the, the, the tape goes in to the camera. The tape, it's a half inch cassette. Okay, half inch cassette. So we went from this three quarter inch cassette, which is about this, this big and about three quarters as wide, to a half inch cassette, which looks like a VHS tape. You, you, you all saw a VHS tape before? Basically, it's, it's almost the same size. It's a little bit shorter and a little bit fatter, a little bit wider, but it's the same. It's, you know, because beta cam, that's, that means the, 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 uh, the tape goes into the camera. So over here, a three quarter inch, the tape was on a separate recording device than the camera. Over here, now it's one person. The camera person is the recording person because the technology shrinks in size. Also what happens in the 1980s is a, is a split. We have a, a professional market and we have a consumer market. You have a pro, pro side, what's going on professionally, and you have the consumer side. Pro professional side and the consumer side. So on the pro side, we have Betacam. On the consumer side, you have VHS. Okay, there's something else called Betamax too, but that, you know, it's very old. Okay. In other words, the consumer side, what does that mean? That means people are buying cameras to record their family functions. Before this, before this 1980s, let's go up that way, we, you know, we're using 8 millimeter film. 1950s, 60s, and 70s. 8 millimeter film, which is a really small film, about that big, and it's on a spool, goes to a film camera. But the same film principles apply. You have to know how to, how to expose that film to light, how much to expose it to. If you need to a brightly lit room or a dimly lit room, you have to change the, 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 the aperture uh, on, the, on the camera constantly. And what happens is, uh, Lots of the stuff is ruined. It just doesn't come back right. It's too bright. It's too dark. And you know, for every like five or six rolls you shoot, maybe you get one back that you shot right. And when I was a baby, that's what they shot. That was the format. I got eight millimeter films of me as as like a five year old, okay, in the 1960s, because that was the format. But that remains the format on the consumer side until the 1980s, when Panasonic comes out with VHS, okay. And Betamax is what well, is Sony. They come up with the Sony device. Uh, Sony comes out with this Betamax type, uh, thing. But when you go to the store to rent movies at that point, you know there's way more VHS tapes available than there are Betamax tapes available. So if you're going to make a decision on buying a machine, people tended to buy VHS machines because their local video store had so many more movies on VHS than Betamax. So this also fueled the camcorder the consumer camcorder market where companies were making these cameras with the tape goes into the camera and you could take it to a wedding, you could take it to a baptism, you could take it to a birthday party, you know, you could take it to someone's backyard, you could shoot all this stuff and you could just stop, rewind and it's, it's there, it's, it's right there for you. you see, but this happened in the 1980s because this, tech, this uh, revolution in tech, what happened? the n represents <coughs> computer technology. Computer technology starts to develop quickly quickly or starts to develop for the home user in the 1980s. I think people, I can, like I didn't have really have my own personal computer until the mid-1990s, but they were around in the 1980s. It's just really very large and very expensive. But by the 1990s, late 1990s, it started to get very more cost effective to be able to buy your own computer and do your own computing at home. I know that sounds crazy, but you, know, you do your own computing with your own, with your own computer or on your phones. I mean, I, I use my phone so much more than I use my computer at home, it's amazing. But it's so much, the technology has changed so much because of it. The reason why is outsourcing, is outsourcing the computer chip. In other words, manufacturers were creating this product and, they, and it was being built in places of the world that was a lot cheaper to build those things and then sell them back into the United States for a profit. And they take some of those profits and reinvest into the process. And really, that's it. I mean, that's what happens. That's why we have phones that we, we can record high definition video. You know, I mean, it, it comes down to that now. We, you know, we're able to do that, which is amazing. But in the 1980s, you have these two markets. So, so uh, after that, uh, you go to 1990s. Okay, on the professional side, you have the digital formats. 
They're called D1, D2, D3, all the way up to D12, I think it went up to. Basically, it was a half-inch cassette format. Was, again, it was a camcorder. In other words, professionally, the, you know, people would go out with a camera on their shoulder and put this digital tape in their, in their camera. And it looked like a VHS tape, half-inch cassette format. But it was recording ones and zeros to the tape. No longer, electron, elect, no longer magnetic pulses that represent uh, light and color. It's recording magnetic pulses which represent ones and zeros. And this starts from the early 1990s all the way through 2000. On the, on the consumer side, you go, I, you know, Super VHS, Super VHS, SVHS, Sony comes out with the palm quarter, which is eight millimeter. Then it goes to, goes to digital eight. This is video. Okay. Then now let's get to the 2000s. Okay, I never know how to say that. Next millennium, 2000. We get to the 2000s. On the professional side, we're starting to uh, do hard disk recording. Which means you're recording to a hard disk on a computer, or you're recording to a hard disk on your camera. The camera was, you know, we'd go out and shoot in the field. But it was recording, you know, we're getting away from cassettes and moving parts and things like that. On the consumer side, it's interesting, it jumped ahead, it went forward, it went DVD burning. You know, cameras were, were being developed that you were able to burn a DVD, a mini DVD disc, in the camera. So once you burn the, cat, burn the disc, you, you record the disc, you can't erase the disc, it's, it's there. And that was the main complaint. People would record over old video, and they'd lose precious video, and something. You know, but now they started to do DVD burning in the camera. You have other devices that you're able to do DVD burning. I mean, I have a DVD burner at home. That's not a computer burner. It's a burner that I'm able to record stuff off the air right to a hard drive and and create a DVD from it. But you know, and then uh, we skip on forward to now. It's I'll, I'll go 2010, you know, plus. Okay. We have a uh, 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 flash memory. And we're doing the same thing. We have uh, the same thing, flash memory. And then uh, down here we'll have cloud storage. And the same thing over here, which is the cloud. But a lot of people don't like cloud storage with a, on a personal level. Let's talk about that briefly. So by 2010s and plus, you have flash memory, which is a little flash, the cards you stick in your phone, right? You're able to record on these cards in a professional camera, OK? And now you're able to record and, and beam the recording to a cloud. And the cloud is being guarded by the company that's hired to guard the cloud for the, for the company that's doing the production. So your camera now is also a Wi-Fi transmitter, able to transmit this footage to a cloud. But because it's being guarded by a separate security company, that's OK. On the consumer side, you've got DVD burning. Then you go to flash memory. Notice flash memory, same thing, same thing. It gets, came, came together. And also now cloud storage. We have capability of cloud storage, and some of us use it. And some of us don't use it because we're a bit skeptical about who's watching our information, right? I, don't matter. I usually, I'd rather burn a DVD of my information and have it uh, or put it on a hard drive, a separate hard drive. Putting it on the cloud, I really don't trust that much because I don't know who's watching it. I mean, I think there's a security company watching it, but, you know. Over here, it's different. You know, ABC or CBS or some, it's ESPN, they're paying a big security company to monitor their cloud. So they can use their cloud for communications. So a camera person in the field is recording information to a, to a flash memory card on their camera. But at the same time, they could beam through Wi-Fi, they could beam this to their cloud service. And so now the editor back in the studio could grab the, the, the footage off the cloud and start editing. And the camera person doesn't have to bring physically bring 
the material back to the studio for it to be edited. So it's all Wi-Fi now. On the consumer side, like I said, we go from DVD burning to flash memory only because the flash memory is smaller. The cards, like the card that's in that camera back there, it's really very small. It's very thin, it's small, and you can fit a bunch of them in your, in your pocket. So it's much more convenient than having, having a DVD you know, in your pocket. And then, like I said, we have capability of cloud storage now. I mean, we can't, tr we can't beam that signal to a cloud that's, that's being recorded on that camera, not that camera anyway, but we have the capability of doing it. But I think people are a bit skeptical about cloud storage and who's watching the cloud. That's basically it. So the, the history of video formats was the lecture we did today. You know, videotape happens in the, 19, uh, in the 1960s, but television happens in the 1950s, so you got that gap and what's going on there. Then uh, you got the development of two-inch video, then after that, the development of one-inch video, because one-inch video is better. It's the improvement on two-inch video, because you couldn't edit two-inch video. And then you get into the 1970s. With 70s, you have the portable format, which goes into news gathering and field production. And the news people are still using 16 millimeter film until this format comes out. Then the 1980s, you have Betacam, which develops the camcorder, the camcorder. And then also the 1980s, because the implementation of outsourcing technology building technology we use in this country elsewhere for a lot cheaper. We have a consumer market and we have a professional market. Professional side, beta cam, di digital formats, hard disk recording, flash memory, the cloud. Consumer side, you have VHS, super VHS, 8 millimeter video, DVD burning, flash memory, the cloud. But you see how it all starts to come together. It all starts to come together again. You know, technology is allowing, is allowing us to, to come together. <clears throat> the video you shoot with your phone could be aired on the evening news. It's good enough. That they'll put it through some color processing and, and, and digital correction. But it's good enough that, that it could air on a news program for, for mainstream broadcasting. 